Okay. Um, good morning. Uh, welcome to the uh, final, the fifth and final webinar in our series of webinars for Ohio's Employee Owned Network. As I mentioned earlier, my name is Chris Cooper. I'm a program coordinator here at the Ohio Employee Ownership Center. Uh, today we have an excellent topic, uh, valuation, understanding the ESOP valuation report. Uh, we have Scott Miller uh, from ESI, ESOP Valuations and Consulting. I've known Scott for a number of years. He's a great presenter and really knows the valuation piece inside, out, forwards, and backwards. So I think without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Scott. Well, thank you very much. <clears throat> Just from the standpoint of a you know, brief background, I wanted everyone at least to know that I cut my teeth uh, with ESOPs from an industry perspective. I was the CFO and VP Finance for a large ESOP company back in the 1980s. It was a manufacturing firm. And I think that makes all the difference in the world, certainly because I approach the valuations and our team here at Enterprise Services approaches the valuation tasking from an industry perspective first, and then of course from the professional compliance second. So with that, let's get started. So keeping in mind that today's topic is understanding evaluation report for the purposes of an employee stock ownership plan or an ESOP. <clears throat> Why is that important? Now one of my speaking techniques is to ask the rhetorical question. Of course, I'm not looking for an answer. <clears throat> but hopefully, if I ask a rhetorical question, you can focus, dial in a little bit, <clears throat> try to answer it. But we have uh, the requirement here for evaluation specifically for an employee stock ownership plan. So the requirements are it must be an independent appraiser. And that's really you know, independent in fact. The evaluation professional or the valuation firm really cannot have a relationship to any of the parties of interest to this transaction. So that includes the company, selling shareholders, or any other related parties. And the appraiser is really the financial advisor to the ESOP fiduciary or the ESOP trustee. We're going to explain why that's important. <laughs> We're the advisor to the ESOP fiduciary. Um, ultimately, though, it's the fiduciary that makes the determination of value by accepting the report from an independent financial advisor. We need evaluation <clears throat> when there's a transaction between the ESOP and shareholders typically outside shareholders, again, parties and interest. There's also a requirement, an annual update requirement um, for plan administration. Our standard of value. Now there's two panels here. Uh, the first panel is <coughs> standard of value as it relates to uh, the definition fair market value. So I'm sure you know, substantially all of you are familiar with the Internal Revenue Service, IRS, understanding of value as documented and enumerated in Revenue Ruling 5960. Well, that's fine. <clears throat> that's half the equation. Our next panel involves an understanding of valuation by the Department of Labor, DOL. So from the standpoint of you know, fair market value in the Internal Revenue Service, uh, the transaction is a hypothetical transaction between a hypothetical buyer and a hypothetical seller. It assumes a financial buyer. So if I ask what's the difference between a financial buyer and other types of buyers, again, that's one of those rhetorical questions. Uh, some of you may think, well, what about a strategic buyer or a buyer with synergies? Well, that's true. And for most business owners, that's the goal or the dream to find a buyer for the company that is synergistic and will pay <clears throat> substantial premium for the company. Well, that's not fair market value. Fair market value is a financial buyer, <clears throat> much like, say, a private equity firm. The ESOP is paying a price expecting you know, a return on that investment without bringing any synergies to the table. Also in today's environment for transactions, 
uh, the overall terms, seller finance, earnouts, all kinds of hedging, if you will, on a transaction price is different. The terms with an ESOP transaction are understood to be cash. <clears throat> now, of course, when I said cash, cash includes debt. And in many cases, you know, the ESOP doesn't have any cash. The purchase price is borrowed, but debt is considered cash. <clears throat> the next aspect to relevant factors is a definition of valuation as <clears throat> promulgated by the Department of Labor. They basically embrace fair market value, but they uh, couch it with the term adequate consideration. <clears throat> and there's proposed regulations from 1988 that delineate and define this understanding of adequate consideration. Well, adequate consideration embraces everything that's fair market value with an extension. <clears throat> There's some ESOP specific items that the DOL wants to be, you know, they insist on having that as part of the report. So a couple of the key things are the repurchase obligation has to be considered. And basically that says, can the company afford to service the redemption of stock from employees that leave the company over time. So, you know, that typically imposes, you know, a pragmatic practical valuation on the company. Ultimately, one of the great protections for a participant is that the company or the plan sponsor must make a market for that stock of exiting employees. It's not kind of, sort of, no, the company must do it. However, the company <clears throat> must redeem the stock good years and in bad. So you have to consider kind of the long view in the valuation process, not the single best two years of the company, but you have to consider the cycles that that company's in. And that, again, imposes, I think, a pragmatic overview <clears throat> on the valuation process. So there has to be a consideration of the repurchase obligation. The next is that um, the DOL recognizes that buying a controlling interest in the company, say over 50%, is something that's common and investors will pay a premium for the control. But the Department of Labor has a two-part test. There is control and appearance so that would suggest, you know, a block of stock or stock ownership in excess of 50%. But the Department of Labor takes it a step further and says there has to be control in fact. So we have a situation whereby if the selling shareholder <coughs> is also the trustee and after the transaction the selling shareholder is the sole trustee and a premium was paid for that stock, well then, you know, the ESOP's paying for something it didn't get. You know, we have the selling shareholder on both sides of the transaction. And what's important is that a control premium was paid. Now, in all fairness, with many <clears throat> transactions, especially smaller percentages, it's quite common for the inside management team or, uh, you know, an owner to serve as a trustee if it's a minority block of stock, especially in smaller, you know, closely held companies. It's not recommended, but it is, it's pretty common. And so I wanted to at least point some of these things out. You know, the repurchase obligation, the control premium, <clears throat> there's narrative and regulations out there that we have to be mindful of. When we look at the valuation process, Basically what happens is that the ESOP trustee or the fiduciary basically is tasked with, you know, with hiring a qualified advisor. Um, due diligence is part of the ESOP trustee's requirements and typically in looking at a financial advisor, you know, there's going to be a qualitative analysis. You know, that's classically part of Revenue Ruling 5960, 
company history, the products, services, how do we bring products to the market, so on and so forth. <clears throat> then we have the quantitative analysis, and of course <clears throat> that's heavy on financial statements, budgets, forecasts. Uh, it's also important for the trustee to frankly ask of the financial advisor, what is your experience in doing ESOP valuations? As we saw in the prior panel, the Department of Labor <clears throat> you know, has specific ESOP-related items that the valuation professional must consider, repurchase obligation and possible elements of control. One of the things I wanted to <clears throat> point out is that under the cautions, we have to keep in mind that the valuation report needs to be defensible in the eyes of both the Internal Revenue Service and the Department of Labor. So from that standpoint, it is <laughs> absolutely a best practice for that valuation professional or the firm to embrace, you know, classically you know, defined, peer-reviewed approaches to valuation. We're going to talk about those in a second. Um, there are certain industries that we found where there's industry rules of thumb, and that is not really fair market value. So, you know, if you're in a specific industry and there's valuation firms that say, well, we have a lot of experience with this industry, be careful. <clears throat> One of the examples is insurance agencies. You know, there's probably countless tens of thousands of insurance agencies, and there's rules of thumb for valuing them. But those rules of thumb are not fair market value, and rules of thumb typically don't consider cash flows and the ability of the company to make a market for the stock. So if anything, you know, if there are industry-specific approaches, if there are some rules of thumb, <clears throat> they generally serve as good sanity checks on you know, better you know, and more documented approaches to valuation, but not the primary driver. One of the things that's important is that the trustee or the fiduciary has to complete a prudent investigation. That prudent investigation is one of the primary functions, and it's, a, you know, again, a fiduciary responsibility. <clears throat> so it's such that um, the prudent process, if you will, includes the valuation professional having access to the management and other company advisors, you know, thorough consideration of, you know, things like historical financial information, the extent to which a forecast is available. Now, quite candidly, we don't run into too many companies that have you know, a freestanding or an existing forecast. We have to be very careful because a forecast can be very self-serving. <laughs> I rarely see a forecast that shows sales declining and profitability eroding. <clears throat> so you know, that forecast has to be you know, the most likely scenario. It has to be pragmatic and defensible. It simply can't be total blue sky. There has to be a consideration of the current economic backdrop. Of course, we're just, you know, we're hopefully emerging from one of the worst recessions anyone can remember. You have to consider not only the overall economy, but also the outlook for the specific industry. A site visit is really mandatory. Sometimes it's a little more difficult <clears throat> to do an ESOP valuation, especially if it's a preliminary report, because of confidentiality reasons. The business owner doesn't want you know, the key employees to know the company's in play. But that said, <clears throat> you know, you still, you know, if you're a professional advisor, you still have to do the site visit. And you, know, you can think of a creative way to, uh, to accomplish that. Uh, number one, don't wear a suit. <laughs> that draws attention. Maybe wear some casual clothes and just look like <clears throat> you're an observer or prospective customer walking through the plant. We're going to get to really the heart of today's presentation, 
you know, assuming that, you know, there's a go, we've dotted the I's, we've crossed the T's, we're in compliance with the spirit of ESOP regulations, <clears throat> and a report has been prepared, we're going to talk about reviewing the report, <clears throat> looking at the elements of the report that are really the drivers of value that are leading to basically an overall valuation opinion that says, you know, here's the price per share, typically for a transaction or for administration purposes. <clears throat> of course, one of the things that's important is that the purpose of the valuation has to be stated. You know, we should see that it's for the purposes of an ESOP, an employee stock ownership plan, and the report is in compliance with all applicable rules and regulations from both the IRS and the Department of Labor. Very important. <clears throat> we also need to know the effective date. So in many cases, you know, if the report is an annual update, for example, <clears throat> the effective date on the front page of the report as an example, December 31st, say 2011. But we also know that that report probably is going to be completed and finished in sometime in March, April, or May of the following year. <clears throat> so the date that it's completed has to be put on the report, but the effective date is typically on the cover. And there can be quite a difference in, in the timing. But we need to see that. <clears throat> We also need to know the overall approaches and methods and the relative weighting of each method in the determination of value. And we're going to see the three broad approaches in just a second. We also need to confirm the outstanding shares. Typically, the report's going to carry a price per share computation. In reviewing the report, you know, the, uh, the inside team at the company should verify the math. You know, it's always a good uh, double check. You know, valuation, pardon me, <clears throat> valuation firms can make an inadvertent mistake or there's a typo, but ultimately, you know, it's that fiduciary that really has a responsibility to make sure that the report is accurate. <clears throat> also, <clears throat> have all relevant factors, you know, con you know uh, involved in determining the value of the uh, company have all relevant factors been considered? This is a quick schematic. It's very helpful to have. And it explains what we call levels of value. Now, uh, if we look at the top line, control value strategic buyer, that's you know, premium paid for strategic synergies. There's been a couple of notable you know, examples, when a buyer makes a run at another company. Some years ago, one of my favorite examples was uh, Microsoft making a run at um, financial planning software called Intuit. And Microsoft was willing to pay an absolute king's ransom for this company, a number that made absolutely no sense from a standard market capitalization approach. I mean, you know, offering 100 times earnings or something like that. This doesn't make sense. Is Microsoft out of their mind? Of course not. <clears throat> what happens is that in that particular case, Microsoft was willing to pay a huge premium for the immediacy of having a product or software that at Microsoft's election could be loaded onto at the time 90% of the personal computers on the planet, you know, anyone using Word or Microsoft software, this could have been folded in. How long would it have taken Intuit to accomplish the same goal? Well, perhaps never, because Intuit has to sell their product one computer at a time in most cases. <clears throat> it never went through um, you know, for <laughs> regulatory issues, but that strategic premium is not, is not fair market value. And a business owner has to understand that. And if the business owner is going to hold out for some tremendous upside value, um, perhaps an ESOP is not the best option for them to consider. <clears throat> when we look at control value, <clears throat> financial buyer, 
Well, then that's possible for an ESOP. To best explain the control value from a financial buyer, we should probably focus on this marketable minority value. And the way that that would be determined quite candidly is, you know, if we had publicly held companies that were sufficiently comparable to our candidate firm, we can get an idea of the valuation of that company from a minority position standpoint by looking at daily transactions of stock in the comparable company. That gives us an idea of marketable minority values. Then, if we wanted to put a control premium on top of that, there's a resource out there called Merger Stat Review and that you know, basically gives us information on premiums that have been paid for publicly held companies. Well, the premiums are computed as medians and means and by industry, and typically a control premium paid for a public company is going to be substantially more than a premium for a closely held company. Big public companies typically have more influence in key markets, whereas closely held companies in most cases do not. <clears throat> but it's the best that we have for empirical evidence as it relates to a control premium. <clears throat> Generally, for closely held companies, uh, as a range of control premiums, especially those that would be approved by, say, an independent trustee, that range is, in most cases, 5 or 10%, a fairly conservative uh, percentage over a minority valuation. <clears throat> Correspondingly, there are certain approaches to valuation that imply a controlled position. And if we have to then you know, estimate a minority value, then we can take a minority position discount. <clears throat> Basically, what happens is that if we have a marketable minority value, uh, there would be a discount for lack of marketability. That's the last little bar on our uh, chart there that would indicate how we would go from a marketable minority value <clears throat> publicly held company to a privately held minority value. Uh, if some of you are familiar with gift and estate taxes, the lack of marketability can be pretty substantial expressed as a percentage discount. With employee stock ownership plans, and because of the signature attribute of ESOPs in that the company or the plan sponsor must make a market for the stock and the company is able to make a market for that stock on a very tax preferred basis, we can deduct you know, the contribution or, and any contributions to the ESOP within payroll limits that typically a lack of marketability discount is considerably reduced from what we would see for, say, gift and estate tax purposes. In many cases, the range of discount for lack of marketability is, you know, 5, 10, 15 percent for gift and estates. The percentage could be easily twice that. So it gets to uh, this slider. We, uh, we get to the slide, approaches to valuation. And there's three broad ways to look at the value of the company, an income approach, market approach, and asset approach. And then when we look, consider a broad-based approach, there's a number of ways to specifically compute valuation. Those are referred to as methods. So we're going to do a quick overview <clears throat> of uh, you know, the different approaches and then methods of computing amounts. We're going to start with an income approach first. And the reason for that is that, you know, because of our signature attribute, this repurchase obligation that, you know, uh, applies to the company, the only way that we're going to successfully discharge that repurchase obligation is through the cash flows, the future cash flows of the company. And that suggests, you know, really focusing on, you know, the income, the cash flows of this business as a primary determinant of valuation. And certainly our experience and certainly in our shop here, 
you know, we really focus on an income approach first and foremost, and in many cases, other, you know, methodologies, valuation protocols are sanity checks on an income approach. You know, with an income approach, we're looking at the ability of the company to generate, you know, the cash to service, in most cases, um, debt related to the acquisition, but also the repurchase obligation that's going to accrue to the company longer term. There's two common methods for <coughs> computing, <coughs> pardon me, value as it relates to an income approach. Capitalization of earnings and then discounted cash flow. Very briefly, capitalization of earnings enjoys the attribute of being easy to understand. We take a single year representation of earnings in many cases, that earnings capacity is an average of several years, and we apply a capitalization rate. We're going to talk about that rate in just a moment. And you know, the earnings you know, capability of the company would be subject to adjustments to normalize the income. Some of the classic adjustments include such things as non-recurring items. Well, as the name suggests, they are non-recurring. In most cases, litigation is considered to be non-recurring, and those things would be added back. And a usually large, you know, single write-off to a large account, uh, fairly common in the recession. Many companies have, you know, have a tremendous track record on collecting accounts receivable. But with the most recent recession, you know, many of them got hit, really stung by one or two collapses. Those are non-recurring in most cases. Those adjustments are made to historical results to try to estimate you know, representative earnings. If we have a new installation, <laughs> frankly, one of the things to quote unquote normalize is the compensation to shareholders or officers of the company that uh, you know, in many cases companies break even at higher and higher levels because earnings are distributed to the stakeholders. Well, with an ESOP, we would normalize compensation in a manner that would suggest here's reasonable compensation to these key um, officers and owners of the company, and uh, anything over and above that you know, is added back into the earnings of the company, which would drive value. Uh, the other approach, uh, rather, one of the things with the capitalization of earnings, yes, it is easy to understand there's a single representation of earnings. Capitalization of earnings works best with stable, mature companies. Um, I'm just trying to think. Many firms are, are like that. Uh, many professional service firms are stable, mature. A lot of engineering firms, you know, they consistently are hitting revenue targets, but they're not growing dramatically. Um, many manufacturing firms are fairly stable uh, in their core capabilities as well. Um, a capitalization of earnings probably is not appropriate for a technology firm that has high growth prospects. Capitalization of earnings does not really capture tremendous growth in the future. If we suspect <clears throat> that there is you know, a high likelihood of you know, profitable growth in the future, then we would use a forecast that would be part of discounted cash flow, DCF. There's a two-part aspect to computing discounted cash flow. There's a specific time period where we're going to forecast results, and then at the end of that specific period, <clears throat> we have to compute <clears throat> a terminal value, which is basically capitalizing earnings in that last year into perpetuity, and then doing a net present value computation, bringing that value back to the current year. So when we look at capitalization of earnings or discounted cash flow, one of the things we have to do is determine our cost of capital or the cost of equity. Now in this particular slide, this is the proximate example of computing the cost of equity. And our source on this 
is a uh, resource called Morningstar Ibbotson. It's classic, timeless. They have rates of return that go back to the early 20th century. They've got about 80 or 90 years of history. So this is you know, true bedrock. It's very defensible, time-tested. It's you know, prevailed in court challenges. And this is called the build-up approach. And you know, so we start with different levels of risk. I'll describe those briefly. And we get to a net earnings discount rate that's in red. The net earnings discount rate is the cost of equity capital. There is an adjustment for long-term growth rate into perpetuity. And we subtract the growth. And the difference between our discount rate, our cost of capital, and the capitalization rate is a consideration of this long-term sustainable growth, which is subtracted. And then we get a capitalization rate of 14%. Now, this particular example is predicated on good empirical data from Morningstar Ibbotson. <clears throat> but there's another resource that's also very good, and it's developed by Duff and Phelps. The reason why I mention that is that uh, <clears throat> this is, you know, Theoretical valuation theory bedrock. Uh, valuation firms rely on this extensively, as do the federal courts. Um, is one resource better than the other? We've seen some reports where both resources are developed and then perhaps averaged, <clears throat> so that you know there's a broad look at you know this important driver of value in the company. This is just the basic formula that's given to us. We start with a long-term risk-free rate of return. That's actually a 20-year T-bill. Uh, the 4.5% is a little bit higher than current because the current T-bill rate is artificially depressed. Long-term horizon <coughs> equity risk premium, 7.1%. That's basically, say, you know, 60 or 80-year return that, say, the New York Stock Exchange type companies have provided in excess of this risk-free rate. Then there's a consideration for size. So we call that the microcapitalization equity risk premium. Again, that's a number that we can literally look up in a book. Then we would have specific industry company risk. That's a risk factor that would be assigned by the valuation firm. And typically, in assigning something, the 2.7, are we that accurate? Well, it gets us to an 18% discount rate. And the 18% you know, for a lot of closely held companies that are established and consistently profitable is a fair equity rate of return that would be anticipated. <clears throat> the long-term growth rate, 4%, that could even be aggressive. The 4% does include inflation, but <laughs> keeping in mind that growth rate is into perpetuity. Well, this is an example of how the equity cost of capital is developed. This is a very simplistic approach. Let's say our earnings capacity is a million dollars. Well, that would be an after-tax earnings. Pre-tax earnings, assuming, a, say, a 40% tax rate, you know, would be the better part of 1.5 million. We subtract taxes, and then we apply our capitalization rate. Remember, that was the 18% less the 4%. And that would provide a suggested value, very likely on a minority position basis, of a little over $7 million. We can also <clears throat> basically develop a proxy for a price earnings multiple if we divide 14 into a million, we get 7.1. And that's a good proxy, if you will, for, uh, for the price earnings multiple. So you can see how that math would work. A million dollars net income times 7.1 <clears throat> provides that uh, computed number. This is very important. The rules and regulations assume the candidate company is a corporation. Even though we all know most ESOPs and most closely held companies are in fact S corporations. 
we would still impute, and we assume you are a C corporation. The um, ESOP does not consider the very, you know, the wonderful tax attributes of S corporations. So that's really an important aspect I wanted to reinforce and emphasize. <clears throat> Discounted cash flow, <clears throat> of course, the, pro the projection needs to be reasonable, uh, not blue sky. Is it something that you know, we have a real, realistic chance of um, obtaining? <clears throat> what happens is that, in many cases, the projection is typically three to five years out. So we are able to compute the value of the company specifically during our projection period, say it's five years. Then we would apply that discount rate or the cost of capital to each single year, and we bring that back to the current year. We get net present value for the next five years. But the valuation model is into perpetuity. So for year six into perpetuity, we have to compute a terminal value. And then basically that's a capitalization of earnings. It's typically year five and we will assume that's a stabilized year. <clears throat> and then we basically capitalize that with a cap rate and then apply an appropriate discount to bring that number to the current year. Then we add up, in this case, six numbers, five specific years and a terminal value. That would be the suggested value for the company. Keeping in mind, <clears throat> this is an income approach for the uh, cost of equity. You know, if the company had a lot of debt, we would consider the cost of debt on an after-tax basis, and we could, con we could compute a weighted average cost of capital. And if that is in the report, basically <clears throat> the weighted average cost of capital is a consideration that's applied to the earnings capacity. But with weighted average cost of capital, we're adding back into the income stream any interest expense, and then we have to subtract outstanding debt from a computed amount. It's just beyond the scope of today to really get into specific computation. But if the company does run with some pre-existing pre leverage prior to an ESOP using a weighted average cost of capital is very appropriate to consider in the overall approach to valuation. <clears throat> so we've talked about an income approach and for ESOPs, and again, because of the signature aspect, this repurchase obligation and the fact that in most cases uh, many ESOPs are leveraged, that is part of the equation, if you will, and part of the attribute that the ESOP <clears throat> is going to employ to buy stock from a selling shareholder. We have a market approach, which is the second broad approach to consider. And in this particular case, there's two methods. One is to consider publicly held comparable companies, and then something that has evolved in the last, say, 15 years, private company transactions. Enterprising professionals back in the mid-1990s thought that, and they envisioned, <clears throat> you know, if we can develop a database with actual transactions by industry and by the size of company and by region, that would be a wonderful resource to at least give us an indication of value, since substantially all those private transactions are for the control of the company using, <clears throat> you know, implied multiples would give us a control value of the company. So if you remember earlier on, I indicated certain valuation methodologies assume a control. And if we needed to value a minority position, we would develop an appropriate minority position discount. That's a classic example of how uh, that application works. Okay. We'll assume that our candidate company is large enough so that we have some publicly traded guideline companies. In our case, we have a number of retail food stores as clients with ESOPs. They're very substantial firms, and the public guideline companies, again, they're fairly stable themselves, and we found that uh, there are some pretty good comparables that are out there, 
and the market generated multiples are reasonable. You know, it provides a pretty good sanity check on an income approach. But we do need to consider reasonable comparability. <clears throat> One of the challenges with publicly held companies is that the firms are so large, they have so many disparate divisions. <laughs> you know, is the company really comparable? That is certainly the case with large diversified firms, even international firms, involved in production or manufacturing. You know, it's very hard to make those, you know, to make that comparable leap. If we do find companies that are comparable, the good news is that there's a wonderful empirical database suggesting, you know, indices of value. Trailing price earnings multiples are good ones. Price to revenue, I don't really like that. What does revenue really have to do with the value of the company? We could have a big company breaking even, and then, you know, the company's really not worth that much. Or price to book value, again, that's a computation that's in the public domain. I don't suggest that as a main driver or determinant to value more a sanity check. If we're using public companies, chances are we would have several indices of value, and we would look at them, <coughs> and <coughs> you know, we would extrapolate and triplicate those results and then make a conclusion or an opinion. There's an interesting aspect with the market approach using private transactions. Some of the more affordable resources that are out there, you may have heard of one resource called Pratt's Stats, P-R-A-T-T-S. Shannon Pratt is one of the you know, business valuation gurus, one of our thought leaders, and he did develop you know, a database. The source of the database, in many cases, um, they're business brokers or investment bankers that report transactions into this database. What's right with the transactional database is that the information regarding that transaction is analyzed and the overall transaction price is basically broken down into, in many cases, a multiple of EBIT or EBITDA. EBIT is earnings before interest and taxes, or EBITDA, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, <coughs> and amortization. Earnings, in many cases, are drivers of value. So with these transactions, reduced, if you will, or recomputed as to you know, multiple of you know, valuation driver, the earnings of the company, <coughs> the databases can be very, very useful and certainly is a sanity check on an income approach. We do have to keep in mind that many of the buyers of these privately held companies are perhaps strategic buyers. And there's an inherent bias, if you will, in the overall purchase price, perhaps or a little higher than what we would normally expect to see. The other thing is that you know, we do try to capture the terms. You know, many of these transactions may have earnouts. Well, you know, that's not a financial or cash buyer that's a requirement for an ESOP. So that's why this transaction approach, in many cases, is a good sanity check on an income approach. But it's very useful, and it's one of the tools in our evaluation toolkit that has evolved and has become value, more valuable with time. When the databases were first introduced, there simply weren't enough data points to validate you know, some of the data that we'd like to use. Um, one of the issues with the databases is that many of the transactions are quite old. Is a transaction from 10 years ago you know, relevant to today? Um, you do need to know that the multiples, there does tend to be a central tendency, and if we have enough multiples, even if many of them are older, you know, if we take a median or a mean of those multiples, we still may have a reasonable sanity check. I wanted to include the asset approach because it's one of the main three. In most cases, an asset approach simply is not proper for an ESOP. I hate to say it, you know, my background is manufacturing, and the book value or the replacement value of the assets 
<clears throat> pardon me, was very substantial. But if it was an industry that was getting, you know, just literally killed by companies, you know, resourcing uh, products and services overseas, you know, we could have a very substantial asset base in a company that's losing money. The owners, of course, would like to say, well, you know, the replacement cost of the assets is very substantial. I would agree, but that's not the standard and a proper way to value a company for the purposes of an ESOP. Keeping in mind, you know, the ESOP has to cash flow. I don't want to spend much time on an asset approach. Another key example that we've seen are companies that are natural resource companies, gravel yards or firms that even are drilling for oil. <clears throat> the overall value of the assets could be very substantial, but the companies just aren't that profitable. You know, they could be sitting on, a, in some cases, a 500-year supply of gravel. Well, who cares? <laughs> you know, we can't pay for it. So, you know, if the assets are far in excess of any, you know, multiple of earnings, well, then the company is almost certainly not a candidate for an ESOP. It just does not cash flow. Uh, we're almost done here. I wanted to cover a couple of other quick considerations. You may see in your report uh, discounts and adjustments. We talked briefly about lack of marketability. If we're using information, empirical data generated from public sources, so I would go back to that Ibbotson panel or the Duff and Phelps, <clears throat> that's rates of return generated from public companies. Public companies enjoy a tremendous benefit of near immediate liquidity and developing a lack of marketability adjustment um, <clears throat> to take us from public company indices of value to an appropriate private company in the index of value, you know, we could have a lack of marketability adjustment. With ESOPs, in many cases, because of the market mandate by the federal tax code, the lack of marketability is typically a smaller percentage than what we would see in gift and estate taxes. The other thing is that <clears throat> this repurchase obligation, this basically uh, a put option that participants have back to the plan sponsor is something that moderates a lack of marketability candidate discount. Uh, because the company has to make a market for the stock, lack of marketability is substantially reduced. That's the current theory, and it has been defended in federal court, and you know, it's well tested. We've also talked a little bit about ownership attributes, and I wanted to emphasize this. Um, earlier in the um, you know, preamble here, there's uh, one of the uh, participants, their company is considering an ESOP, and they're thinking of you know, doing a transaction, and that transaction is less than 50%. Well, that would clearly be a minority position transaction. And as such, there's a small discount from a control price that would apply to a smaller percentage. If, in, you know, if we had a situation, and so many companies are 100% ESOP S corporations for these breathtaking tax benefits, keeping in mind a 100% S corporation ESOP basically is an income tax-free entity. And, but if we have that situation, if the ESOP does have 100% or a very high percentage of stock, there has to be control and appearance. Then it's appropriate to ask questions. Who's the trustee? Is there a trust committee? Is that trustee or the trust committee comprised of um, individuals or, say, a, a company that's not the selling shareholder? Now, that's a good faith attempt to make sure that the ESOP is in control. The ESOP is permitted to pay a control premium, the extent to which a third party would pay for control. So those are some of the key parameters as it relates to you know, an additional consideration. So you know, wrapping up here, I wanted to emphasize that the trustee or the fiduciary determines the value of the stock by accepting the valuation report. So by accepting this report, 
and by approving that report, the trustee is really determining the value. So the trustee certainly has a vested interest in making sure their financial advisor is well-versed on ESOP metrics, mechanics, and has a lot of experience in this area. It's important for the trustee to understand the assumptions and the key elements of the valuation. One of the overall goals I had today was to provide vocabulary <clears throat> for those that were listening. It's not enough for you to rely on an outside authority on valuation. You know, if you are part of a plan committee or you know, a trustee, you really have to understand what's in that report. You simply cannot assign that obligation away to the valuation firm. And with that, we're very close to conclusion. Do we have any uh, quick questions here? Uh, Scott, before we uh, kind of open the floor, this is Chris again, I wanted to mention that um, one of the things I like to do when I run a webinar is we have a, a question and, and, and answer time uh, while we're recording. But if there's folks on the line that want to ask questions that they don't necessarily want to be uh, have recorded for posterity's purposes, um, we can certainly um, at some point stop the recording process and then open up uh, the floor again as well for questions. So I wanted to put that option out there for everybody. Well, why don't we do that? Um, I would assume that questions could be company specific, and then we do have confidentiality aspects to that. So if there is a question, I would say uh, let's stop the recording, and I'd be happy to field any questions that the participants may have. Okay, I will go ahead and do that. Uh, it'll be a second here. Thank you. Please stand by.